Just before Halloween, educators received an early scare. Trick or treat with the report that student test scores plunged in the U.S. as the COVID-19 pandemic erased decades of academic progress. With math scores recording their largest decrease ever and reading scores at a 30-year low, according to alarming new data known as the nation's report card. According to the New York Post, no state or big city notched any improvements on national math tests, while kids on the cusp of high school were particularly impacted according to results from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. While reading scores, meanwhile, dropped to 1992 levels when they began testing for this level of academic proficiency, the New York Post reported that overall, the national average math score for fourth grade fell by points since 2019, from 241 to 236 out of a possible 500, and eight points for eighth grade from 282 to 274. And playing some math with math scores, this tells us that the average fourth grader before the pandemic scoring less than 250 on a test with a top score of 500 or half so was getting only half a little less than half of the math questions marked correct which does not sound like a success story while the eighth grade the gateway to more advanced mathematics courses like algebra geometry trigonometry probability and statistics and maybe even pre-calculus and calculus that you're definitely going to need if you want to get through some of those college courses, the average students were barely getting three quarters of the questions correct. And now, after a year of not attending in-person instruction, for whatever reason, those scores declined sharply. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, along with some recent news regarding the current public health crisis that the president had declared as over in September, as students were returning happily to school and in-person instruction equipped with what have been described as safe and effective vaccines, often described in percentages, which are math. Hello, boys and girls. My name is Major Mike Webb, and I am not, at least by certifications or profession, a teacher. But when your daddy is a preacher, you can expect to find yourself at least as a substitute teacher in a Sunday school class, or working during the summer as a teacher's assistant in daily vacation Bible school. When you get a little older, graduate from college, and get a job at least as a uh, front lines operations manager, you are probably going to be involved to some extent in employee training. And if you happen to join the military and rise through the ranks of the company command, you uh, are probably going to be involved to some extent in uh, a lot of training, ranging from officer professional development for subordinate officers and for others in the unit, especially for annual and quarterly requirements like equal opportunity training, personnel and computer security training, straight on through to soldier common task training, if only to ensure that soldiers assigned to your command can attain minimum proficiency in common skill soldier tasks and other mission essential tasks on your mission essential task list or medal by acronym to provide a briefing to your higher commander at the quarterly training briefing or QTB where you can tell them that you are in command of soldiers that are trained, untrained or need more training and one reason why we continue to train besides getting a good mark on our officer evaluation report especially in the military is a recognition that some skills require practice. Practice, practice. Because they are what is described as perishable skills. Because not everything is quite like riding a bicycle. Once you learn, you never forget. That's the way that some people have described the vaccines. They kind of lose their effectiveness and so you have to go for a booster shot, get another dose. Sometimes that's what you have to continue to do in order to maintain proficiency in what you try to do with some of these basic skills like reading and math.
So once you get beyond the gateway of eighth grade and find yourself in high school, probably the very first mathematics course that you are going to begin is what is called algebra, where the most common thing that you will probably be doing for at least a year is simply looking at mathematical equations separated by an equal sign and solving for the quantity x, the unknown or what is called in science a phenomenon and you probably after that year sit there and say I am never going to do this again for the rest of my life well perhaps not and at least with regard to declining math scores we can definitely state that during the pandemic there was a sharp decline empirically established in mathematics and reading scores a scientist would want to attempt to not only recognize that there is a problem but also, as best as he or she could, determine the cause, because that's what science is all about, finding the cause. And, at least in the military, in what is often called the Military Decision Making Process, or MDMP, we are going to have someone grab a notepad to become the scribe, as everyone takes turns trying to put down everything that is currently known. No assumptions, no guesses, no hopes, no aspirations, just what is known. Kind of like Gene Kranz on Apollo 13 in the movie. To frame the problem within some limited context that might provide more understanding of the problem and perhaps assist in pointing the direction to develop what are described as a commander's critical intelligence requirements or CCIR. Intelligence drives the mission cycle. The more that you know, the more questions that you can ask to kind of make things more refined. Or questions that we may require to answer and develop that clearer threat picture. Find out what we're dealing with. Proposing essentially an educated guess or hypothesis to test through empirical inquiry and investigation. Kind of like a scientist. And just based upon what is known, one could probably safely assume that as soon as schools let out, to the extent that it is established that reading is a perishable skill, as borne out by the score decline, since nobody was assigning books and materials to read, it looks like it appears, or as they say in court, apparently, students just decided to stop reading because they weren't told to do so. They didn't have any level of curiosity. Never got so bored just sitting around for two years that they just decided to start reading some book, or a magazine, or even scientific report. If only to become more informed about this once-in-a-lifetime pandemic and maybe even try to get involved to assist in becoming a part of the solution and not just somebody stuck in the problem and not just a spectator and victim of the pandemic even with all of the emphasis on communal responsibility and maybe that's something that needs to be looked into just in terms of the curiosity that you need to develop to become a good student and not have those skills perish when suddenly school doors are closed. That is just a hypothesis and it appears to be supported by the data because somehow, perhaps just long COVID, reading skills decline. And we can probably safely assume that very few, if any, students sitting around for two years just decided to become the electric company easy reader for math, just looking around for math problems to solve. But again, this is simply a hypothesis, subject to empirical investigation and inquiry to be validated through a scientific method. But it would just seem to be common sense that if math scores decline sharply down to the lowest levels during these two years, perhaps people were simply not doing the math. Intriguingly, there was actually a lot of math discussed during the pandemic, as public health officials reporting on a scientific phenomenon, relying often on projections based upon mathematical and stochastic models, reported metrics quantifiably, and findings in the form of percentages 
90% efficacy, 20% positivity rate, 4.6 secondary attack rate, and so forth and so on. And at least to a scientist, both these terms and these percentages mean something and should mean something to you or they wouldn't be reporting them. And if you don't know what they mean, then maybe you need to ask or do a little reading to find out so that you can be smart in a once in a lifetime legal pandemic. Numbers and especially percentages matter. But before the pandemic, researchers found by testing recent college graduates that if asked whether a bank account earning just 1% in interest during a time in which there was just 2% inflation, they could not even guess whether they were gaining, losing, or breaking even on their return on investment. And that is just simple math that a student, at least by high school, should be able to perform. And certainly someone trying to win at the lottery, or at the racetrack, or out in Vegas at the uh, casino. And if you plan to do well on your investments, to enjoy a great retirement of leisure, just traveling all around the world to all of the places on your bucket list, maybe a refresher course on percentages may be worth that investment. If only not to wake up surprised at the age of 65 to learn that you can't retire like everybody else and are going to have to just keep on working until you die because you lost all of your money in foolish bad investments. Just a thought for consideration. Or you can wait to find out on your own. In September, around the time the president had declared that the pandemic was over and had suggested that we now have great vaccines and protection, Joseph Freeman and others had published in the Vaccines Journal a peer-reviewed report in which they had proposed that there was a need for formal harm-benefit analyses, particularly those that are stratified according to risk of serious COVID-19 outcomes for the mRNA vaccines, which over 80% of Americans have taken. Over 95% of those age 65 or older. And as you might imagine, when it comes to weighing costs versus benefits, it is going to involve just a little bit of uh, quantification and some numbers and understanding of those numbers. And at least a little bit of math, because as Lieutenant General Jody Daniels, the commander for the U.S. Army Reserve and a graduate of Carnegie Mellon with a uh, degree in applied mathematics, said at the very beginning of the vaccines rollout, if I play roulette, and contract the virus, I could become asymptomatic or on a respirator. I don't want to risk finding out where in the spectrum I'll fall. I want to protect myself, my family, and my coworkers. And you look like an intelligent person. So let's now perform a practical exercise, just to bone up on a little math, using a recent study conducted to examine veterans a population during the pandemic from which scientists were able to locate a large quantity of data. And Paul Kim and others reported for the first time in October 2021 that they had examined veterans at the Ann Arbor Veterans Care Facility between December 2020, when the vaccines first became available, all the way to April 2021, not long after the announcement of a wider availability of the vaccines through the American Rescue Plan, announced by the president on the anniversary of the pandemic, and where 25,000 veterans had already been vaccinated, but only 55% of the veterans were patients being served by that particular health facility. Although there was a surge of infections in Michigan, only 20 veterans reported being infected from COVID-19 which would be less than 1% of the total population of veterans and less than 1% of the veterans receiving care at that facility or a very small number of veterans even being infected. So at least it looks at that facility like there wasn't even really a large risk of being infected to cause someone to want to get a vaccine. That's the way that the data looks. And from this sample during the study period, 20 patients, 20 patients were hospitalized with COVID-19. Of the 10, 
or HAP were fully vaccinated. Seven with the Pfizer, BNT162B2, and three with the Moderna mRNA1273 vaccines. And they provide a little information on this very small sample. Half of the 20 who were hospitalized with COVID-19 fully vaccinated. The mean time between second vaccination dose already had two shots and diagnosis of COVID-19 was 49 days. So within under two months after getting the shot, the veterans who had been infected experienced a breakthrough infection and only half of the total of the 20 were even hospitalized. According to the report, all patients with vaccine breakthrough infections were older than 70 years of age. Nine were Caucasian, one African-American. Six had a BMI greater than 30. All had multiple medical comorbidities and one was immunosuppressed. So all of the patients for whom the vaccines failed to prevent infection tended to be older. And if you are not in that category, this suggests a profile. But this may only reflect the typical veteran clientele that seek care at that facility, or what is called an ecological bias, requiring further inquiry to refine that picture. But also had multiple illnesses, which is typical of like 75% of all COVID-19 uh, patients uh, that uh, experience adverse outcomes at least. And all were considered to be obese by BMI and other comorbidity with COVID-19, which again may suggest a profile or again be explained by some other factors subject to further inquiry. And in that study, one of the 10 vaccinated veterans actually died, fully vaccinated and still died. And this was known by April 2021 that vaccines would not necessarily prevent infections, prevent hospitalizations, or even death. This was already known. By December 2021, when the WHO director had stated that the, to the United Nations that we underestimate this virus in our own peril, Paris Gabby C. Fracco and Dimitra Dimopolo completed a report published in the Metabolism Open Journal in which they had suggested that just one year into the vaccine's availability, besides the common and usually mild side effects of the authorized vaccine, some rare major adverse reactions are increasingly being reported worldwide during the post-marketing surveillance phase of vaccine circulation. However, they concluded at that time that despite rare cases with complications from COVID-19 vaccines, the net benefit risk ratio shows a clearly favorable balance towards COVID-19 vaccination for all age sex groups. Remember, these products were not developed with a large number of years passing for us to determine long-term effects. They were only tested initially on the emergency use for minimal safety standards. Will you die immediately? And for efficacy, not effectiveness. Does something happen when the virus is introduced to the body? In August 2022, that picture had changed. And Hamadreza, Kopeyaya, and Hossein and Sarak, publishing in the International Immunopharmacology Journal, wrote that mRNA vaccines are associated with greater risk of adverse events following immunization. But still, they had concluded that at the present moment, the benefits of all types of vaccines approved by WHO still outweigh the risks of them and vaccination, if available, is highly recommended. Essentially, lacking any data in terms of possible serious outcomes, those who were taking the vaccines were basically the participants in a large sample size phase three clinical trial to find out whether or not the vaccines were safe or not. 
and looking not at a global compilation, but limiting their focus to veterans, where there is a large amount of data tracked at veterans care facilities. In September 2022, Joseph Freeman reported in the Vaccines Journal that overall, there was a 16% higher risk of serious adverse events, SAEs, to include death, near death, disability, incapacitation, birth defects, and other significant medical events in mRNA vaccine recipients than placebo recipients, which is significantly high. The Pfizer trial exhibited a 36% higher risk of serious adverse events in vaccinated patients in comparison to placebo recipients, which is extremely high, exceeding one-third for one of the most popular vaccine products, which was the first to be distributed and later approved by the FDA, while the Moderna trial exhibited a 6% higher risk of SAEs in vaccinated individuals compared to those receiving placebo a less popular product within the veteran community and still with a significant risk to consider when comparing with the risks associated with COVID-19 infection, comparing apples to apples. Yet for the Moderna product, as early as February 2020, it was known particularly for men 16 to 19 years of age has the highest rate of myocarditis in the few days after receiving the Moderna vaccines. As recently confirmed by Giovanni Carroll and others in the BMC Infectious Disease Journal, a leading journal in the United Kingdom and the first to ever report the discovery of the first human coronavirus in the 1960s. Similarly, for the Janssen product, a single-dose recombinant replication incompetent adenovirus vector vaccine, which, which as of July 26, Second to 2021, 187 million persons in the United States had received at least one dose, according to Hannah Rosenblum, reporting in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, MMWR, one of two major publications produced by the CDC, where serious adverse events have been reported after COVID-19 vaccination, including Godine Barr syndrome, GBS, and thrombosis, with thrombocytopenia uh, syndrome, TTS, after Janssen COVID-19 vaccination and myocarditis after mRNA uh, vaccination. But their assessment continued to be that the benefits outweigh the risk for rare serious adverse events after COVID-19 vaccination. Subject to more data, basically other persons who have volunteered to take this product to be the safety test to determine whether or not it is safe or not. While in Peru, leading the world, according to Johns Hopkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health Index, the case fatality rate for COVID-19, the other factor to look at in a cost-benefit analysis, is as high as 5.2%. In the United States, however, the chances that a person might die if even infected is only 1.1%, compared with the risk of experiencing a serious adverse event, including death, near death, disability, incapacity, birth defects, or other significant medical event, at about 16% overall, as low as currently as 6% from Moderna, and as high as 36% for the more popular Pfizer vaccine. So, this is simple math in cost-benefit analysis. Test time is 1.1% chance of dying playing Russian roulette with COVID-19 greater than, less than, or equal to 6% of playing Russian roulette with the vaccine product. How about 16%? How about 1.1%? chance of dying of COVID-19 versus 36% chance of dying, having near death, or rather significant event by taking the Pfizer vaccine. You look like an intelligent person. This briefing is unclassified.
advertisement was authorized by Mike Webb.